Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome our host, Senior Minister of State for Finance and Transport, Mrs. Josephine Teo. Mrs. Teo is accompanied by our guest speaker, Chairman Orient Overseas International Limited, Mr. Tong Chi Chen. Senior Minister of State for Finance and Transport, Mrs. Josephine Teo. State Secretary, Ministry of Trade, Industry and Fisheries, Norway, Ms. Delake Ihan, Deputy Secretary International, Ministry of Transport, Mr. Kevin Sham, Chairman, Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore, Mr. Lucien Wong. Distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the ninth Singapore Maritime Lecture. My name is Greta Georges and I'll be your MC for this afternoon. Now, as you are well aware, the Singapore Maritime Lecture is an anchor event of the Singapore Maritime Week. Launched in 2007, Singapore Maritime Lecture is an esteemed lecture series that features prominent personalities sharing their knowledge and insights on key maritime issues, and this year sees the ninth installment of the series. Without any further ado, may we invite on stage to deliver his opening remarks, lectures moderator, chairman of BW Group Limited, chairman of BW LPG, board of directors, and director of BW Offshore Limited, Mr. Andreas Soman Powell. Mr. Soman Powell, please. Good afternoon. A warm welcome to Mrs. Josephine Teo, Singapore Senior Minister of State for Finance and Transport, Ms. Delek Ahan, Norway State Secretary of Trade, Industry and Fisheries, Mr. Lucien Wong, Chairman of the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore, Mr. Tung Chi Chen and Mrs. Harriet Tung, Uncle CC, as I would rightfully call you in Hong Kong. <laughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be moderating the ninth Singapore Maritime Lecture. This gathering is organized by the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore, and it is a central pillar of Singapore Maritime Week, bringing together all of you here who play an important role in shaping the maritime industry. The first speaker at this lecture series, which a number of you attended and will remember, was the founding father of modern Singapore, the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, whose recent passing brought great sadness to our nation. For today's lecture, we are honored to have Mr. C.C. Tung, Chairman of Orient Overseas International Limited, or OOIL, and an eminent figure in the global maritime community. Also known as OOCL, the group was founded by the late Mr. C.Y. Tung in 1947, which makes it nine years more experienced than my own family business. As many of you know, OOCL is one of the world's leading container shipping companies. It has a fleet of about 100 vessels, capacity of around 540,000 TEU, and is a member of the G6 Container Alliance. Just this month, the company announced the order of six 20,000 TEU vessels in Korea. It is also listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange in case any of you want to buy shares after today's talk. <laughs> Ticker number 0316. <laughs> the company has a great track record thanks to the capable management of its key shareholder, the Tung family. Even during recent challenging years, OOIL has outperformed most of its peers. And I hope that Mr. Tung will provide us some of his secrets in a moment. If not, please prepare good questions to force him to reveal those secrets in the Q&A session. Mr. Tung has been chairman of OOIL since 1996. And he is also a director of Cathay Pacific Airways and Yuming Marine Transport. He is a member of the Hong Kong Logistics Development Council 
and the Hong Kong United States Business Council. He is also one of the special breed of business leaders who is both extremely clever and extremely nice at the same time. He is going to treat us to his insights on the changing dynamics of the container shipping industry. At the end of his talk, he has agreed to take questions from the floor, and he and I are counting on all of you to make it an engaging and interactive session with lots of tough questions. Uncle CC, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Andreas, for that uh, very, very kind introduction. Mrs. Josephine Tio, Ms. Delecta Ehan, Mr. Koji Saki Mizu, Mr. Lucien Wong, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm deeply honored to participate in the ninth Singapore Maritime Lecture this year and be part of a wonderful lineup of distinguished speakers in the past, as Andrea said, including the late minister mentor of Singapore, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, one of the most respected statesmen of our generation, who kicked off the inaugural session in 2007. It's also a privilege to be speaking during the Singapore Maritime Week an important event in the industry calendar where we all gather for an excellent series of conferences, dialogues, and discussions on all things maritime and beyond. Over the past few years, many of us in the industry sailed through some pretty rough weather. We were challenged by turbulent market conditions met tough operating environment, and everyone struggled for profitability, and some even for survival. It was not long ago, during the turn of the century, the world economy was booming, and global trade took off on an impressive trajectory, particularly after China's accession to the WTO. Entering into what one might call a super cycle, where we saw rapid acceleration in international trade and economies reaching tremendous annual growth level for a good number of years until the global financial crisis of 2008. The devastating impact of the crisis ran wide and deep. The following year, massive government stimulus programs bailouts were rolled out, and to this day, the road back to securing solid growth levels continue to be a challenge for many major markets around the world. China, the second largest economy, is also struggling to sustain growth momentum, and the policy adjustments made to counter the slowdown in the market became ever more important. Closer to home, the global container growth rate over the past 25 years can be categorized in three periods or market cycles. The growth period between 1992 and 2001, averaging 8.5 percent. The boom period between 2002 to 2008 at around 10.8%. And although the data shows 2010 through 2017 averaging at 6.4%, we are now seeing the latest IMF forecast for global growth at below 4% for the next few years. Now, if you look at the chart, the bottom line, it shows the relationship between GDP growth and trade growth in container uh, shipments. It came from 2.6 times to recently at 1.3 times. And if we 
apply that multiple, it will give us actually just about 5% growth of container trade going forward. Following the global financial crisis and rapid decline of consumer demand growth, particularly in the OECD countries, China and indeed the region's manufacturing sector for world consumer goods took a big hit. Against this backdrop, trade patterns were also affected by the evolving supply chain dynamics and the industry found itself treading in quite a different environment. With the end of the golden era of double-digit trade growth, things weren't quite what they used to be, and perhaps the lower container demand growth is what we are seeing as the new normal in markets today. But in terms of container shipping industry, some might find it interesting to observe that there is really nothing normal or nothing new in the sense that we still operating within the same parameters and using more or less the same sets of tools to adjust to the changing external environment around us. In other words, the industry's business model has not changed much over the years, focusing our efforts in managing our operations around three fundamentals area, revenue, cost, and regula regulatory factors. Revenue is largely impacted by forces of supply and demand economics. On the demand side, I believe that I need say no more, as we are already familiar with the theory behind the rise of industry China that supported the massive outsourcing trend of the OECD countries, leading the world economy into a super cycle period which ended after the fallout of the financial crisis. As I had illustrated earlier, container trade growth is intricately linked to those market forces, and in most ways, so does our revenue. On the supply side, the story here is also a familiar one. Irrespective of good or bad times in the market cycle, the industry tends to overinvest in new buildings, as there is a tendency for carriers to grow their market share and enhance profitability in the up cycle, while effecting unit cost reduction during the severe down cycle. With this behavior, the industry constantly suffers from the syndrome of perpetual excess capacity, forcing the industry to become more commoditized and cost-driven. If I may quickly relate our points in discussion to our own experience over the last 25 years at OOCL by referring to this chart, a similar chart, uh, we began our investment program in new building a fleet of new and efficient tonnage with 5,000 to 6,000 TUs size ships in the mid 1990s. 8,000 TEU ones in the early 20s when the economy was booming. These ships were among the largest as well as the most efficient ones in the industry at the time. Their efficient design and sizes provided us with the advantage of low unit cost and operating efficiency, as well as enabling us to better compete with the bigger players in the industry. Approaching the financial crisis, the industry saw continued new building activities especially mega-sized vessels from the larger carriers. The severity of the recession has taken the industry six years to reach a sustainable but subpar container trade growth of 
As we all began to see the unicorn's advantage of these mega-sized vessels, lions did not enter into any ordering of large vessels during the protracted period of down cycle, now felt compelled to do so, even when there is no clear signs of better demand growth on the horizon. For OCL, we decided to order our first series of 13,000 TU size mega vessels in 2011. And this year, we contracted for 21,000 TU size vessels. From our own experience, during the strong growth years, the scale cards only bring you part way to success. The success of building a profitable liner business also require a robust and systematic way of managing total costs. In other words, apart from the investment in hardware, we found that an effective operating system is critical to achieving cost efficiency. Some 25 years ago, we be began our quest for building an effective operating system by investing in IT technology and capacity to enhance our ability to better manage the vastly extensive and complicated shipping data being processed in our business in order to improve operational efficiency. Keeping costs down while at the same time raise service quality to customers. Back then, where mainframe computers were mainstream, we realized the data consistency was problematic under that infrastructure, and we did not have a clear view of our costs in order to price our products properly. And as a result, many decisions were made suboptimal. Instead of continuing with ubiquitous mainframes, which were then threatened by the looming Y2K problems, we took the bold step to deploy object-oriented technology on an open client-server platform that would be internet-ready. The reusable objects provided a modular approach to system maintenance and upgrades, not dissimilar to assembling products with Lego pieces, which had shortened the development time for system modification by almost 80% and substantially reduced operating costs. The efficiency and scalability of this new technology turned out to be the key to our performance success. As a result, our internet in integrated regional information system, or IRIS in short, was born, providing us with real-time information on active shipment, their near-term milestones, and not the least, an inventory control of our assets, which is dispersed over the globe. Quality improved substantially under IRIS due to the fact that more timely and accurate information is visible to the right parties. We had less service failure, easier recoveries, and could better prepare for coming events. The sharing information helped reduce wastage and could facilitate better collaboration across regions. In addition, the ability of IRIS to subdivide and coordinate individual tasks had led to successful implementation of off-site service centers that support our global activities 24-7 at a fraction of the cost. In some better quality, higher efficiency had helped us to do more with less and reduce our administrative overhead from over 12% of our revenue in the 1990s to just over 6% today. 
if we may, if we may take a moment to look at what is trending in the industry today, the transportation and logistic environment has been evolving much around the advances of e-commerce. More than ever before, speed, reliability, and service quality are of growing importance to everyone in the supply chain. With the rapid growth of the wide application of e-commerce, there were a greater need to focus our efforts on IT development. Since Iris' inception in 2000, year 2000, two generations, two new generations have evolved as we can